Welcome everyone, and thanks for participating in this joint Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society and American Glaucoma Society webinar on hot topics in glaucoma. I'm Steve Getty, and I'll be moderating along with my esteemed colleague, Dr. Fong. Next slide, please. We have an outstanding group of speakers from Asia and the United States, and we'll be formally introducing each of them prior to their presentations. Next slide, please. We encourage you to ask questions during the lectures, and you may do so by clicking the question icon. You then type in your question and click the ask question button to submit it. We have some scheduled uh, Q&A at the conclusion of the presentations and we'll address the submitted questions at that time. I'll turn the program now over to Dr. Fong. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon or good evening wherever you are. I I'm Dr. Sing Kiong Fang from uh, Malaysia. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the American Glaucoma Society and I would like to introduce my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Gede. Uh, he is the professor at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute and also in the board of directors of the American Glaucoma Society. And uh, he is also the chair of the Glaucoma Preferred Practice Guideline in the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And also uh, most of you all know he's the study chair for the TVT and the primary TVT study. So going on to a bit of introduction of our Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. Uh, this is our mission statement is to promote excellence in diagnosis and care of patients of, with glaucoma in, uh, in all, all levels uh, in the individual and in the community and to eliminate glaucoma blindness in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, a bit on the history, at this moment, I would just like to uh, mention uh, our appreciation to Professor Robert Rich, who is actually one of the first members of the EGS uh, to be in contact with us uh, since 1994, when we formed the Asia Oceanic Glaucoma Society, and 1997, when we have our uh, South Asia Glaucoma Interest Group. But now we merge and already form uh, the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society in 2011. And uh, I, I know uh, Bob is uh, among us in, in the audience. We would like to appreciate uh, his help and, and uh, uh, guidance uh, to us for all these years from the AGS. Um, I would like to encourage all of you to join the, our society. These are some of the benefits which I will not go through uh, in detail. Uh, just uh, click on the QR code our, this is our website, and if you have any queries, uh, this is the email address. Uh, you will uh, get a response from uh, Coralie, our scientific uh, society manager. And uh, just to announce the um, next year's, uh, actually it's, this is supposed to be in 2020, but because of COVID, we have postponed it to 2021. And the latest is that we might be just having uh, this meeting uh, fully virtual, but uh, uh, we will uh, announce this uh, later on. Without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Norman Aquino. He is the present Secretary General of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. He will be talking to us uh, on uh, myopia and glaucoma, uh, strange breed, breed fellows. Good morning. I bring you greetings from the Philippines. For the next few minutes, I will be presenting issues pertaining to the relationship that exists between myopia and glaucoma. Hopefully, you will see and understand why I describe them to be strange bedfellows. With the increasing incidence of myopia worldwide, coupled with the global prevalence of glaucoma, especially in an aging population, the occurrence of these ocular conditions in the same person is very likely to increase. For this talk, the only thing that I would like to disclose to all of you is how privileged and honored I am to be part of today's session. There is strong evidence that confirms the link between 
myopia and glaucoma. Studies have shown that as high as 30% of POAG patients have concurrent glaucoma and myopia. The Blue Mountain study was the very first large population-based study that examined the role and relative strength of myopia as a risk factor for glaucoma. Myopic subjects had a two to three-fold increase in the risk of glaucoma compared to non-myopic subjects. Myopia was also found to be a greater risk factor in the Asian patients and patients with Asian descent compared to the Western patients. It is therefore very logical to ask, is the myopic eye more susceptible to glaucoma? And if so, why? We all know that there are structurally features in the myopic eye that make it different from the non-myopic eye. The difference lies in the various morphologic and morphometric changes associated with myopia and the resulting biochemical changes that follow. Taken together, they can certainly make up an eye to be predisposed and vulnerable. This diagram shows the various pathways by which glaucomatous damage can be brought about. The deformation of the optic nerve head will result in the stretching and thinning of the lamina cribrosa and lead to the loss of structural and functional support to the retinal ganglion cell axons that pass through its pores. The structural strain brought about by intraocular pressure can certainly amplify and aggravate the damage to the axons. I'd like us now to take a closer look at what happens to the optic canal of the myopic eye. Here are the three layers that make up that canal, the Brooks membrane opening, the choroidal and the scleral opening. With increasing axial length, the optic disc changes in shape from circular to oval, and is accompanied by the development and enlargement of the peripapillary gamma zone, usually on the temporal side of the disc. This results in misalignment of the layers of the optic canal. This change in geometric relationships can of course increase susceptibility to axonal damage. Here is a myopic nerve with glaucomatous damage. The green arrows point to the gamma zone, while the black arrows point to the delta zone. These whitish areas located temporally are without underlying choriocapillaries and without the signs of the retinal pigment epithelium. The blue arrows delineate the disc borders. The white ones are pointing to kinked vessels that are situated close to the border of the disc, implying that there is significant loss of neuroretinal tissue. Just to tie everything up, I'd like to share with you a few cases. The first case is a 58-year-old myopic male who was screened for glaucoma because of suspicious-looking optic discs and a family history of POAG. As you can see, the traditional glaucoma workup showed very good structure and function correlation. He was therefore adjudged to have glaucoma and was started on topical intraocular pressure lowering drops. Seems to be simple enough, but let me tell you, there are relevant questions that may pertain to this case. Are the functional and structural abnormalities in this case solely because of his glaucoma? Or could the myopia have contributed to these two? Should this patient be treated like any other glaucoma patient? Will the target pressure goals be the same? Will this patient's myopia influence the rate of the progression of his glaucoma? And how best should this myopic and glaucomatous eye be monitored in the future? 
Here's another case. A 24-year-old male who wanted to have LASIK done on his eyes. For this case, my concerns include, number one, are the findings consistent with myopia? Or is this already early glaucoma? Are there any diagnostic tests that I can order to help determine which is which? Can LASIK be recommended? Am I going to deprive this young person of the life-changing effects of LASIK based on just mere suspicion or fear of development of glaucoma in the future? And if, what if, after LASIK, he develops glaucomatous neuropathy? How am I going to treat and monitor him? As you can see, it is not easy. The clinical detection of glaucomatous optic neuropathy in a myopic eye can be quite challenging. When looking at the disc, the spatial contrast between the height of the neuroretinal rim and the depth of the cup is reduced since the stretching of the lamina leads to the flattening of the optic cup. The color contrast between the pinkish rim and the pale cup is reduced because in myopic eyes, the neuroretinal rim often appears pale. The usual parameters by which we go clinically and judge cup size, rim width, are literally thrown out of the window. Even the structure function investigations may not be sufficient. OCT will be unreliable because of the irregularities involving the peripapillary region. Perimetric defects can be due to retinal changes and patchy atrophies in the posterior pole associated with myopia and not because of glaucoma. The myopic eye therefore should be considered a special eye. It must be regarded as an eye at high risk and as such, it needs to be monitored through time. And because conventional methods may prove insufficient, more sensitive and specific strategies are needed and have to be explored. So what do we expect in the future? We need to create and build up myopic specific databases in our perimetry and OCT machines. We can expect a shift in focus from the area of the optic nerve and the peripapillary area to the macular area for macular ganglion cell evaluation. OCT and geography can be used to assess the radial papillary capillary network. Our NFL texture can also be used to gauge any change that will happen. We also need to look at the Brooks membrane opening as a parameter to watch as we look out for any changes in the myopic and glaucomatous eye. And lastly, with the increasing digital digitalization that is coming, we need to use artificial intelligence to help us achieve our goals. And I am sure the next speakers will expound on artificial intelligence and its use in glaucoma a little more. Indeed, the relationship between these two is complicated. And with this realization, it is my hope that we as clinicians be all cautious in dealing with our myopic patients. Thank you very much. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Professor Keho Park. He is now the president of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. And he is also the president-elect of uh, the Glaucoma Research uh, Society. And he will be talking to us on opening the black box of uh, deep learning in glaucoma. Professor Kihopa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Kihopa Park at Seoul National University. What I'm going to share with you today is about opening the black box of deep learning in glaucoma. 
I have no financial interest related with my talk. Artificial intelligence is the ability of a machine to mimic human cognitive functions. Machine learning has a narrower concept, meaning the ability of a machine to learn without needing to be explicitly programmed. Deep learning has a narrowest concept to represent the ability of a machine to learn using multi-layer neural networks modeled after the visual cortex. For deep learning in glaucoma imaging, the optic nerve images pass a feature learning and classified as glaucoma or non-glaucoma according to the probability calculated through the hidden layers because of these hidden layers, we do not clearly know how the machine decides the image to be glaucomatous or not. This is a case of a lady in which a disc hemorrhage was detected by chance in the routine health checkup in 2009. Fortunately, she had her previous fundus photograph of 2016, which showed no definite abnormality. Her intercular pressure was 16. She was followed up more than 13 years. Two episodes of recurrent hemorrhages were detected in 2012 and 2016 in the intertemporal neuroretinal rim. You can find the RNFL defect has developed later and progressed in the region of this hemorrhage. The visual field by standard automated perimetry were within normal limits until 2016. While the RNFL and GCIPL loss has been already detected in 2012. And there was a continuously uh, progressed. Um, a guided progression analysis for the ganglion cell layer in a plexform layer is a kind of artificial intelligence as it tells whether the glaucoma is progressed or not by comparison between the baseline images and the current image. We know that in glaucoma, the visual field is asymmetrical across the horizontal raphe, as you can see in the glaucoma hemifield test. Similarly, the same principle can be applied to the GCIPL thickness. The right-hand side figure is showing the cu custom software developed to perform GCIPL hemifield test to detect glaucoma. This glaucoma hemifield test and GCIPL hemifield test are good examples of artificial intelligence. The healthy eye in the first row showed normal GCIPL hemifield test. The preperimetric glaucoma case in the second row with very early inferotemporal RNFL defect showed asymmetrical GCIPL loss in the corresponding region with the outside normal limits in the GCIPL hemifield test. The early glaucoma case in the third row showed RNFL defect with visual field abnormality and abnormal GCIPL hemifield test result. This is one of the pioneering papers regarding deep learning in diabetic retinopathy. Deep learning could assist to detect diabetic retinopathy from the fundus photograph effectively. Our group has shown that deep learning could predict atherosclerosis from retinal fundus images. We may use deep learning to create 3D image from a 2D disk photograph using a deep learning algorithm. A disk photograph can be converted into a super resolution image, which is converted to 3D image by 3D builder. This is an example of 3D movie converted from a 2D image using deep learning. You may find slope on the cup and peripapillary atrophy. When we integrate peripapillary RNFL map with the macular GCIPL map, we can get more information in glaucoma progression. In this case, GCIPL change was detected earlier than the RNFL change. This is an opposite case where the RNFL change was detected earlier 
than the GCIPO change. Our team has developed a method called ensemble training in which both GCIPL and RNFL thickness and deviation maps. A total of four OCT images were fed into NASNET and classified as glaucomatous or non-glaucomatous. The AURC was significantly greater than any of the single OCT parameters. Similarly, the deep learning algorithm discriminated glaucomatous and compressive optic neuropathy with significantly greater AURC than any other single OCT parameters. This is a new approach using an OCT trained deep learning algorithm for objective quantification of glaucomatous damage in Bundes photographs. More than 30,000 pairs of these photographs and OCT RNFL scans were used for training by convolutional neural network. There was a very strong correlation between predicted and observed RNFL thickness. The AURC for discriminating glaucomatous from healthy eyes were not significantly different. So using deep learning method, the fundus photographs can be assessed objectively and quantified for the amount of neural damage. The left side figure shows an example of the prediction of RNFL thickness by deep learning and the actual RNFL thickness by OCT. The heat map in the right-hand side shows where the deep learning is looking for the quantification. However, we still do not know how the deep learning algorithm is quantifying the, the glaucomatous damage. We only depend on the heat map as shown in the left side figures. To build the heat map, occlusion tests are performed as you can see in the right side figures. Recently, there has been a report presenting a breakthrough to explain deep learning result called adversarial explanations. The picture on upper left is an original image of a concrete mixer truck However, the deep learning output was a tow truck with a prediction value of 0.26. If the image has been changed like in the middle, the prediction value for the tow truck increased up to 0.98. And if a change was made into like an upper right image, the output was a trailer truck with the prediction value of 0.99. And if the image has been changed like in the middle of the second row, the first choice classification was a car with a prediction value of 0.75. So the adversarial examples may help understand how deep learning algorithm is classifying the image in addition to where on the image. Recently, our team has reported a study result on the explainable deep learning using adversarial examples for glaucoma detection. More than 6,000 of fundus images of health screening patients were evaluated. Surveys for explanations using adversarial examples and a conventional heat map based GradCam method were performed among the glaucoma specialists. Adversarial examples show significantly higher score for location and rationale explainability than heat map based grad cam. The first row shows the original fundus images, the heat map based grad cam negative and positive pathology images are in the nearby small windows. The second row shows the negative adversarial examples and the third row shows the positive adversarial examples produced using only the predictive deep learning model and the original sample image. As you can see in the second row of glaucoma negative adversarial examples, the cupping is decreased and the neural retina rim is increased. On the other hand, in the third row of glaucoma positive adversarial examples, the cupping is increased and the neural retina rim is decreased. So our study firstly has shown how deep learning algorithm is classifying 
glaucoma on fundus photographs. This figure is another example. The left column is the original images of glaucoma cases. For the case in the first row, positive adversarial example for glaucoma on the right column has shown that the cupping is increased and the new retina rim is decreased and the contour of peripapillary atrophy becomes more prominent. On the other hand, negative adversarial example in the middle column is showing the opposite findings. For the case in the second row, the positive adversarial example of glaucoma on the right column shows prominent RNFL defect, while negative example does not. These are the take home messages. Using deep learning method, the fundus photographs can be assessed objectively and quantified for the amount of neural damage. Deep learning may enhance the ability of OCT in glaucoma diagnosis and detection of progression. Adversarial explanations may help medical professionals more clearly understand the rationale of deep learning methods when using them for clinical decisions. I'd like to thank all the participants who contributed to our research. Thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Dr. Ahmad Araf. Dr. Araf is an associate professor as well as medical director and vice chairman of clinical affairs at the Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary. He will be discussing new developments in ocular imaging for glaucoma. Well, thank you for joining this session, uh, new developments in ocular imaging for glaucoma. Uh, this is my financial disclosure, which is not relevant to the remainder of the subject matter in this presentation. When we think about using OCT for glaucoma diagnosis, we typically categorize the various parameters uh, into three. And the first is optic nerve head parameters. And then of course is parapapillary retinal nerve fiber layer parameters. And the third and most novel is macular parameters. And so uh, in this presentation, we'll be briefly uh, highlighting each of these uh, three categories. And the first is the optic nerve head. I think we can all appreciate the limitations of clinical stereoscopic exam of the optic nerve. Um, multiple studies have shown poor agreement among practitioners in terms of agreement on features of a given optic nerve, and even poor agreement uh, with the same practitioner examining the same optic nerve at various time points. There is wide variation between clinical exam and optic disc reading center findings. And these differences are clinically significant in a large proportion of patients. Novel OCT scanning protocols rely on the capturing and delineation of Brooks membrane opening to more objectively measure optic nerve head parameters. Uh, of course, we know that Brooks membrane is a five layered matrix that resides between the chorio capillaris and the inner retinal pigment epithelium. And an opening within Brooks membrane allows the optic nerve to exit the eye. And so we can use this opening to our benefit and refer to it as an objective demarcation of the optic nerve rim border. The Brooks membrane opening minimum rim width parameter or the BMO MRW parameter as obtained by the spectralis OCT is derived from a protocol that automatically identifies the borders of the BMO and then acquires 24 radial B scans centered on the optic nerve. The shortest distance from each of these points to the internal limiting membrane is used to calculate the BMO MRW parameter. I think the total BMO area is also useful, especially when assessing asymmetric discs. And this information can be easily missed, but is located on the display of the optic nerve SLO image. This is a patient of mine that has suprotemporal thinning of the neuroretinal rim that corresponds with an infranasal visual field defect. The MRW map on the lower right-hand side shows consistent depression in the suprotemporal sector. 
Distance values as well as percentiles are compared to age-matched controls, uh, which are displayed on the map. Stag and Maderos performed an observational cohort study comparing diagnostic performance between the BMO MRW parameter and conventional retinal nerve fiber layer. They found that overall global retinal nerve fiber layer thickness parameters outperformed global BMO MRW parameter with respect to diagnostic accuracy. Infrotemporal thickness was the highest performing BMO MRW parameter. An important strength of this study is that a diagnosis of preperimetric glaucoma was made on the basis of structural damage, which was detected in a longitudinal manner. The serious HD OCT algorithm for measurement of the neuroretinal rim thickness differs from that of the spectralis device. Optic nerve head measurements with this device are derived from a standard cube of optic nerve and peripapillary signal data. And rather than measuring the shortest distance between Brooks membrane opening and the internal limiting membrane, the Sirius device calculates the smallest cross-sectional area among polygons that are generated from 180 disc margin points to corresponding points on the internal limiting membrane. These measurements are used to plot neuroretinal rim thickness around the circumference of the optic nerve and also to calculate various other parameters that are displayed in a data table. Our next parameter is peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, which of course has been the cornerstone for us in terms of uh, digital imaging for glaucoma. With faster scanning rates achieved with spectral domain OCT, diagnostic accuracy for the various retinal nerve fiber layer parameters has been shown to be quite high. Studies on these devices from different manufacturers are consistent in finding that the superior and inferior sectors and clock hours tend to give us the highest diagnostic accuracy. Deviation maps are extracted from thickness maps and are color-coded to accentuate areas of thinning compared to age-matched controls. Uh, I find these deviation maps very helpful in my day-to-day -day clinic, and they help to differentiate retinal nerve fiber layer pattern loss from other causes of signal loss, such as signal artifact or other retinal pathology. Deviation maps from the spectralis device are not yet available in the U.S., but should be in the near future. The most updated spectralis device software allows practitioners to choose from three different peripapillary circle scanning diameters. And this can be helpful in cases of peripapillary pathology, such as myelinated nerve fiber layer. It's important to remember that although measurements among various devices correlate strongly, they are not entirely compatible and should not be used interchangeably. Next, we'll move into macular parameters. And since a significant proportion of the retinal ganglion cell population resides in the macula, structural glaucomatous deficit may also be detected and monitored in this region. The Spectralis posterior pole horizontal protocol is composed of 61 B scans, which are centered on the fovea and correspond to 20 degrees of the central visual field. Total macular, macular retinal nerve fiber layer, macular retinal ganglion cell layer, and or macular interplexiform layer thicknesses may then be segmented and measured and displayed in an eight by eight grid containing 65 individual cells for performance of symmetry analyses between eyes and also within the same eye. The Sears protocol segments the ganglion cell and interplexiform layers and measures the thicknesses of these two layers within an elliptic annulus, which is centered on the fovea. The area of the annulus is divided into six sections of average thickness data, which is compared to HMAP controls. Of the various measurements obtained with the GCIPL protocol, it's the minimum GCIPL thickness, which has been shown to have highest diagnostic performance. It's also important to note that as with optic nerve and retinal nerve fiber layer parameters, macular parameters measured with spectralis OCT and serous OCT devices are not interchangeable. Uh, some takeaway points from this brief presentation 
are the OCT-derived optic nerve head, retinal nerve fiber layer, and macular parameters all show high levels of diagnostic performance and reproducibility. Use of Brooks Membrane Opening, or BMO, has standardized our optic nerve head parameters. And enhanced segmentation algorithms allow for isolation of macular layers most pertinent to glaucomatous damage. And it's important to remember that measurements cannot be compared across different device manufacturers. I'd like to put a plug in for an upcoming issue of Current Opinion and Ophthalmology, which will be covering some of the topics uh, in this presentation, as well as much more. Uh, this issue should be published early next year. Thank you very much for your attention. Welcome back. Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Professor Paul Chiu from uh, Singapore. And uh, he is our chief editor of the Asian Journal of Ophthalmology and the long-term committee of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. And he has got uh, many uh, research and patents uh, in, uh, going on. And uh, one of them is now he's going to talk on, which will be how to get the best result with pass planar micropulse laser. Professor Paul Chu. Uh, hello everyone, uh, we're going to talk about pass planar micropulse laser therapy and uh, I'd like to just discuss today how we can get better outcomes and the limitations of this therapy. Uh, pass planar micropulse was developed by myself um, some years ago, about, about almost 10 years ago. At that time we were trying to look for a non-destructive uh, method of lowering intraoperative pressure with laser that was more effective than existing uh, trabeculoplasty type therapies, but not uh, psychodestructive like the G-Pro. Today, we will look at the overview of how it, we think it works, the hypothesis of that, uh, what patients are suitable, and the limitations of what patients should be used on, and uh, finally, on to um, a guide for treatment and how we can by using the correct pre- and post-op therapies, optimize our outcomes. The g probe, as you all know, is a ciliary body destruction. It attacks uh, and burns the pass placata here. And this reduces IOP by primarily de decreasing aqueous production. The difference with the micropulse translator therapy and MP3 uh, uh, therapy is that it treats the past planar. So we don't touch the past placata at all. We're way back here in the past planar and we are disrupting the pigmented epithelium um, at this point in the hope that this will increase and uh, enhance uvuscular outflow through the uh, enlarged extracellular space. Alternative hypotheses by Johnston include ciliary muscle contraction causing shortening uh, and a posterior inward movement of the spiral spur. Here are the probes that we see, and you can see these are uh, the first generation ones. And here's the current generation two that's out now. And it's much better. It's got a thin neck and smaller foot plate, and it's easier to use for smaller palpebral apertures consequently. And uh, this is, I think, a big improvement in terms of uh, ease of use. Micropulse is applicable to a lot of patients. Uh, we are using it in adults, although some pediatric work is starting, but do consider when you're choosing your patients, things like personality, do they squeeze a lot? Do they have a small palpebral aperture? Because that makes it very hard to position the probe over the past planar, and you'll end up inadvertently lasering the past placata, which does not work. Um, race is an issue in the sense that you may have different energy le levels or settings, and, and your timing and energy may be different depending on the pigmentation of the uh, individuals that you are dealing with. When you deal with uh, patient selection, the three big areas that we tend to use micropulse translator therapy in. And um, we can use it, of course, in primary and secondary glaucomas, uh, open and closed angle, refractory and non-refractory. However, they are also useful for patients intolerant to medications and those who are unfit for surgery and those needing additional IOP lowering. It is also very useful as a temporizing measure before incision of glaucoma surgery, and I find that aspect particularly useful. Uh, when we look at the patients, 
as uh, before the treatment, we tend to consider things like discussing with them what this laser can achieve uh, in terms of the success rates. And this is a kind of nice way of thinking about it. In, uh, if you're looking at a patient with primary open angle, where you're trying to replace adding another medicine with a laser uh, TLT, then you can get about 30% IOP reduction without having to add a medication. If you're, however, looking at a refractory patient with, let's say, uh, failed trabeculectomy, angle closure, chronic angle closure, or, or neovascular disease, oops, sorry, uh, the, you may get up to about 30 to 40% lowering and a decrease of, um, of medicine by one medicine. And this is useful to augment whatever therapies they are currently on, medical and surgical. So it depends on what type of patient they're using this for. Uh, we tend to use either a peribulbar or a topical anesthesia. And it depends, again, on whether you want to do a single treatment or a retreatment. Some patients just cannot uh, tolerate topical because their eyes are inflamed or the surface may be very swollen and they may need more than just topical anesthesia. But the calm patient with a quiet eye does take the topical anesthesia very well. The settings I use are a two watts, uh, 100, pulse, 100 second pulse envelope. So 50 seconds above and 50 seconds below in two hemispheres. The standard duty cycle uh, of 31.3%. Uh, and uh, we, this is a, the total amount of energy delivered, 62.6 .6 joules. Uh, however, bear in mind that individually, you may have to um, change, increase your time. Some, I know some centers use uh, 80 seconds per hemisphere. And again, this is what works for your patients. So this is for my uh, particular patient group. And uh, the things to think about when you're actually doing this therapy, this, this is kind of important. You have to think about the liquid interface. You, you know, are you, are you having a dry eye or is, is the probe tip adequately uh, moist so that there is no dispersal of energy during between the air and the eye from the tip? Um, the orientation of the probe, you know, with some presbyopic professors, myself included, uh, you have to make sure you have the right side of the probe facing the limbus, so the round side towards the limbus, the flat side towards the lids. With the new generation two probe, no problem there, you can only get it one way. So that's uh, very, very much easier to use and much less likely to make mistakes. Uh, the position of the limbus, remember that the epitree probe should be positioned about two millimeters, two millimeters behind the limbus over the past planar, so two to even three millimeters is fine. You're over the pass planar, you don't want to be over the past plicata. And please keep the probe aiming at the center of the globe throughout the laser therapy. As you're painting the eye, don't tilt the probe and let the laser energy you know, uh, kind of drain away sideways. Um, adequate pressure is important. When you get anxious, you press too hard. We've seen some surgeons pressing very, very hard on the eye as if they're trying to you know, cut the eye with a, with a blade, which is a, maybe a feeling that they're more used to. Here, you just need adequate presser, pressure by putting a pen to paper, no more than that. You just want to blanch the blood vessels. Whether you do movements across a hemisphere at a time or a quadrant at a time, just do that whichever way your wrist feels most comfortable and dwell time of four to five passes per duration. So let's say you're doing 50 seconds or 80 seconds per hemisphere, try to make sure you spread it out between about four to five passes and do it evenly so that the energy, the dosology is equal throughout the area treated. The power is about two watts and uh, depending on your needs, like I said, 50 to 80 seconds per hemisphere. We try to avoid the horizontals. So please don't uh, laser the three o'clock and nine o'clock regions as there are long posterior, posterior ciliary nerves and arteries there. So we try to avoid that. And we just pass the laser, as you can see, smoothly and radially with the tip of the laser coming out a bit behind about here, this area, um, so that you can treat the entire pass planar across the top of the eye. And this is a technique using uh, you know, uh, the entire movement hemispherically from left to right. Uh, Post-operatively, I like to give about steroids. So I give about low the max three times a day, a bit of uh, oral analgesics, maybe some patients have needed, but most of them don't. And don't stop the glaucoma medicine. This is kind of important. Uh, continue all your glaucoma eye drops after the laser. 
And when you review the patient in a few days, then make a decision on whether the, the laser has been effective and whether you need to low and decrease medicine. And so do it by maybe one drop at a time, see how it goes. Review your patients over time and, and see how the laser is performing. So how does the laser perform? Well, on, the, uh, on, on our patient load, here's a, a, a paper done just out October this year. Um, and the mean IOP decrease for this group of patients we just uh, have looked at was from a pre-op of 31.5, um, mean IOP, millimeters mercury, to about 22 at one year and 23.8 at two years. So this was with um, a glaucoma med medicine reduction from 33.3 medicines pre to about 2.4 medicines at two years. So it does uh, keep pressures down for a proportion of patients. But when we look at failure as those who need an increase in glaucoma medicine from baseline uh, or, uh, um, or more or a raise in pressure above the uh, success criteria, then we should see that about half failed by one year. So many patients with advanced glaucoma do have a pressure rise uh, after this therapy, about half uh, persist. Here you can see the pressure levels over uh, six months, one year, two years, and three years. The proportion of pressure lowering in terms of, of uh, whether you could get the pressure down from 10%, 20%, 30%, or 40%, for advanced here, you can see the proportion remains the same across six months, one year, two years, three years, although the end number at three years is small. So the proportional response doesn't change much. It's really the ones who succeed, they don't have uh, on, ongoing disease, will stay controlled, but the ones with active ongoing disease will fail. What about retreatment then? So for those that had successful treatments, maybe about 65% stayed under control at one year in one study, this study we did, 15% uh, more after two treatments, and overall about 20% that did not respond to this therapy. That was in a very early study we did in 2010. Uh, in 2015, we had another study where we should, so could show, again, similarly about half responded after single treatment. We added another treatment, we got another 30% down, and by a third treatment, you're only having a diminishing return, 17%. Uh, responding. So yes, retreatments can be done, but you don't have as much success with additional treatments. So finally, what about if we looked at a therapy that could perhaps give us a little more uh, pressure-lowering effect where Micropulse 3 laser TLT had not been successful in lowering pressure. So here are a bunch of patients that we've just reported in Journal of Glaucoma this year, and uh, they've got pressures uh, of around baseline 33 millimeters. 33.7 after Micropulse prior uh, treatment. And with using a form of therapy called Micropulse Transpiral uh, or what we call Micropulse Plus um, modified technique, we were able to get the pressures down from 33 to around about 23 uh, at 12 months. Uh, and there was uh, also a reduction in glaucoma medicines from 3.4 to uh, 2.8. So there was no prolonged inflammation or hypotony. So let me just share with you this additional plus treatment, which gives us a little more um, uh, therapy effect than the standard Micropulse 3. So what we call it, at the moment we call it Micropulse 3 plus, Micropulse plus. You do an MP3 treatment, much the same way that you do a standard one. Uh, I use two watts and you tackle 31.3 and 100 seconds and we treat the whole uh, two hemispheres as usual, avoiding the horizontal. After finishing that, we immediately go on to a second point where we do pulsed therapy, single shot therapies to the pass planar, not the pass placata, to the pass planar using 1.6 watts with a higher duty cycle of 41.1%, and we fire two seconds per spot and about six to eight spots per half. So you can see we fire these shots here and these additional shots help to disrupt the pass planar surface, allowing an additional leak of fluid through the pass planar and increasing the uviscular outflow. And that's the plus technique that we've been using to get that additional effect for those who are TLT non-responders. The probe is the same probe. There's no need for any different probe. 
So again, in conclusion, it's an easy therapy, but you, you've got to get it right. Please remember that you, you, you have to be using it carefully and sticking to the uh, guidance that I told you just now. Don't tilt the probe, keep it in the right position, treat the past plane and not the past peccata. It is powerful when you use it correctly. And I, I thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Dr. Joseph Panarelli. And Dr. Panarelli is an associate professor of ophthalmology and chief of the glaucoma division at New York University. He will be discussing creating the perfect bleb, microshunt or trabeculectomy. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe Panarelli. I am the chief of glaucoma at the NYU Langone Health Center. And I'm pleased to be invited to uh, talk today to the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. Uh, and I am going to be talking about creating the perfect bleb, trabeculectomy versus micro shunt. And so, you know, the, the idea for the next 10 minutes is sort of to walk through, um, you know, my thoughts in terms of, you know, where trabeculectomy fits into my treatment algorithm uh, currently and how uh, newer subconjunctival microinvasive glaucoma surgeries, you know, might change uh, the way I manage glaucoma in many of my patients. And I'll talk about some of the new data from a, a pivotal trial comparing these two procedures. Here are my financial disclosures. So I think the big question to be asked is, do we really need a better bleb forming procedure? Isn't trabeculectomy good enough? I mean, you look at the results of some major trials uh, throughout the last several decades, and we see that you know, if trabeculectomy is taught the right way and, and uh, people continue to refine their skills, we can get really spectacular outcomes with trabeculectomy. Um, you know, look at the results of the TVT and the PTVT. We have, you know, good data going out five years supporting the, the use of this procedure. And, you know, I, I think, you know, as, as the years have gone on, I, I do find myself probably doing more and more uh, trabeculectomies for certain types of glaucoma. But now with the advent of microincisional glaucoma surgery and uh, other advances in our field, we have so many procedures available to us that, you know, um, I, I think the number of trabeculectomies being performed worldwide is actually decreasing. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. But, you know, I, I do think it still has a, a wonderful place in our treatment uh, um, algorithm for glaucoma. You know, I think one of the questions that many of us have with trabeculectomy is, is, you know, do we do it the same way every single time? We want to perform glaucoma surgeries that get us predictable, reproducible results. And I think that is one of the frustrating things with the trabeculectomy. There's still a lot of variation with regards to this procedure. I know for many of us, we vary the concentration of mitomycin C, we vary how we open the conge, how we close the conge. Sometimes we vary our flap size, how tight we make our flaps, how many sutures we put in the flap. And so it's hard to get consistent results when we are sort of trying to make subtle variations to the procedure in order to adapt it to each patient that's right in front of us. There's also issues with post-operative management. Our IOPs tend to be, you know, somewhat volatile. Sometimes on day one, even though I've made the flap nice and tight, I can have a very low pressure. Uh, other patients where I think I've titrated the flap perfectly, I end up having a very high pressure. And so, you know, we see that the pressures can go up and down a lot in that first post-operative month. And there's always the question of when do you lice the sutures? Do I wait too long? Did I lice the suture too quickly? And so again, there's a lot of variability with the technique when it comes to this procedure, and it's really hard to standardize trabeculectomy. And so, you know, while I think it has a, a, a real, um, um, it is very useful for our patients, it's very hard, again, to standardize for this procedure and get reproducible results. And I think that's why for many of us, we're looking to find newer procedures that are, um, you know, maybe easier to perform and get us more consistent results. And then you have the complications, which, you know, when you're performing traditional glaucoma surgery, we know that, you know, the old adage, no pain, no gain, that if we want to get a low final intraocular pressure, you know, we often have to take some element of risk. And that is very true for trabeculectomy. I mean, many of us are, are plagued by bleb leaks and, and uh, you know, times uh, those can turn into bleb-related infections. We have choroidal effusions, choroidal hemorrhages. So, you know, in our efforts to titrate that pressure very low, sometimes we have to deal with some of the issues that come along with very low pressures. So I think that's where this new um, uh, class of procedures uh, comes in, subconjunctival MIGs. And, you know, you may not want to call these minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. Maybe these subconjunctival procedures are really subconjunctival LIGs or less invasive glaucoma surgeries. But suffice it to say, these are new procedures that I think bridge the gap between a canal-based 
glaucoma procedures and the traditional glaucoma surgeries. And so what fits into this you know, class of procedures? Well, you know, right now I think it's two devices. It's the Zen gel stent and the Preserflow micro shunts. And so these are two micro shunts that are gonna shunt fluid from the anterior chamber into the subconjunctival subtenon space and they are bleb forming procedures. So you know, very similar to our traditional glaucoma surgeries, um, hopefully in terms of the efficacy that we get, but maybe they have a better safety profile, something more akin to the canal-based procedures. They may not be quite that safe, but um, you know, they do probably land somewhere in the middle. One of the reasons I like these procedures is that I can use these across a wide spectrum of disease. I think these subconjunctival um, NIGS procedures are great for our patients with moderate disease. I think if you choose your patients carefully, you can use these for certain patients with advanced disease. And you can even use it on the other end of the spectrum, maybe a mild patient who's on a, a significant number of medications. And so, you know, when you're looking at a NIGS procedure that might be able to eliminate medication burden, this is a really nice option. And this is a, a probably a better procedure for actually trying to stop the disease progression, not necessarily just slow it down. These are bleb forming procedures. So you're gonna get pretty good efficacy. So, you know, when looking at point four, you know, we joke around that some of the canal-based procedures maybe fit into a category of MEGS or minimally effective glaucoma surgeries. You don't really have to worry about that with bleb forming procedures. If these work, you're gonna get some significant IOP reductions. And I think the learning curve with these procedures is fairly simple. These really are sort of uh, really just, I think, uh, um, these are similar uh, to some of our traditional procedures, um, but maybe not quite as complex to perform. So now that's kind of why I'm excited about some of these new procedures. So we're going to talk more about one of the first head-to-head -head comparisons of uh, trabeculectomy versus the Preserflow micro shunts. And so these are the one-year results from a randomized multi-center trial. And I have to thank my co-authors as well as the team at Santan who really helped put together this, this fantastic study. And here's the financial disclosures for all of the uh, authors that are on the one-year manuscript. And so what is the micro shunt? So the micro shunt is a subconjunctival glaucoma implant uh, that is made from SIBS material, which is a, a highly biocompatible and bioinert material. And it's actually used in cardiac uh, stents. So it's been well tested and well proven um, in the human body. The design is what's really important here. It's eight and a half millimeters in length with a 70 micron lumen. The design here is that if you were to place the proximal end into the anterior chamber and the distal end outside the eye, the pressure should equilibrate nicely into the low teens or, or high single digits. And so that's based upon Poussey's law. And so you'll see here, this is the proximal end that's gonna sit in the anterior chamber uh, and the distal end will sit here beneath the tenons capsule. And again, it's eight and a half millimeters in length. And I'll show you a video demonstrating what this looks like. And we're gonna talk today about a two year randomized single mass multi-center study that was conducted in both the US and Europe. And it really assessed the safety and effectiveness of standalone microshunt surgery versus trabeculectomy in patients with primary open angle glaucoma. And we're going to talk about the one year results here. So who was included in the study? Patients aged 40 to 85, uncontrolled glaucoma. So they had to have an IOP between 15 and 40. So keep in mind this number here, the 15, this is pretty low. So we had a good number of patients in this study who ran a pressure between 15 and 21. And those are some of the harder patients to treat. They were all on maximally tolerated medical therapy. Here are the exclusion criteria. So of course, previous conjunctival incisional surgery, many forms of secondary angle closure, as well as secondary open angle glaucomas were key exclusion criteria. What did we measure at year one? So the primary outcome was to look at a reduction of at least 20% in IOP at year one without increasing glaucoma medications. So that's our primary outcome. We also looked at IOP over time, as well as the need for supplemental glaucoma medications. There were key safety endpoints that were also evaluated. We looked at the incidence of hypotony maculopathy, post-operative interventions, as well as endothelial cell density. So let's just quickly take a look at the actual micro shunt procedure. I think everybody is probably familiar with trabeculectomy and, and would prefer not to see one here. So um, we start off by making a fornix based conjunctival flap. And I think for many of us in the study, we were you know, somewhat inexperienced. We hadn't performed many of these procedures. So we, we made a pretty broad opening. We used mitomycin and we used 0.2 milligrams per ML uh, for two minutes on four half moon pledges. And so that was part of the other reason for having a larger dissection here. And I think for many of us, when we do perform this later on, we will use the mitomycin off label and just inject it subconjunctively. We'll remove all the pledges and then rinse with BSS. 
we take this double step knife and we're gonna make an entry about three millimeters in length into the anterior chamber. And then we'll take the micro shunt and slide it into this track. And you'll see the, there are fins on the micro shunt which are gonna slide nicely into that little pocket that's, uh, that we can see here at the, the entry into the sclera. We prime the device and you should see nice percolation of flow from the distal end of the micro shunts. And then we bring the tenons and conjunctiva over it and close in a watertight fashion. And that's it. That's essentially the micro shunt procedure. So that's what we were comparing against trabeculectomy in this study. So let's look at the demographics. Pretty well matched as one would expect in a three to one fashion. So we randomized three to one, three in the micro shunt group to one in the trabeculectomy group. So 395 total patients in the micro shunt group, 132 in the trabeculectomy group. And you see again, nicely matched for age, for gender, for lens status. But here, I just draw your attention. Look at the mean diurnal IOP. It was about 21 to 22 in each group. And again, a lot of these patients had a starting pressure under 21. So almost 60% of the patients in this study had a pressure under 21. These are traditionally some of your harder patients to get down to those very low final IOPs and to achieve success. Also keep in mind, they were on a good number of medications. So they were on about three uh, classes of glaucoma medications, and they had significant visual field loss. Look at the mean Humphrey uh, visual field mean deviation in decibels here, so about a minus 12 decibels in both groups. So how did we do? Overall, almost 54% of the microshunt patients and about 73% of the trabeculectomy patients met the primary endpoint, which again was a 20% reduction in IOP from year from baseline to year one without increasing the number of glaucoma medications. And so if we actually took out those patients with the lower pressures and say, hey, let's just look at the patients who had a pressure over 21, how did they do? Well, we see the success was even better, almost 64% in the micro shunt group and about 75% in the trabeculectomy group. So you know, overall, trabeculectomy definitely did better in this study. Probably part of it was because some of these patients had a lower starting IOP. And with trabeculectomy, you can titrate the pressure down as low as you want. The micro shunt really does not have that ability. What you see is what you get with that uh, nice titrated regulated flow. Well, what did we get with the micro shunt? We really did get consistent uh, reproducible IOP reduction. And, we, and you see how consistent it was through the post-operative course here when you look at the actual plot of the pressures. The pressure dropped from about 21, 22 down to about nine to 10 millimeters of mercury. It did creep up over time as we would expect some, some episcleral fibrosis and scarring to a final pressure of about 14.2 at year one. The trabeculectomy group really just did phenomenal. Started off with the pressure again, 21 to 22. And again, this is what you would typically expect over the first month as we are intervening and cutting sutures, the pressure did, did get lower consistently and ended up with a final pressure of about 11.2 at year one. That is fantastic. I wish to say I, all my traps came out like that. How about the number of glaucoma medications? Well, a significant reduction in both groups. We went from about three medicines in each group down to 0.6 in the microshunt group and 0.3 in the trabeculectomy group. And this is another key stat. Look at this. It's almost 72% of patients in the microshunt group and almost 85% of patients in the trabeculectomy group were medication free. And you might say, well, how is that possible given, you know, some of the rates you just showed for the, you know, the primary endpoint? Well, again, some of those patients did not have very high starting IOPs. So maybe they didn't get the 20% reduction, but maybe they did get off all their medicines and drop a point or two. So for certain patients that may have been success. Safety, I think this is really where we start seeing uh, some of the benefits of the micro shunt. Because we have that nice titrated, regulated flow, this is a very safe procedure. So look at endothelial cell loss, very similar between the two groups. Hypotony maculopathy, lower in the micro shunt group, though the incidence was actually pretty low in both groups. Post-operative interventions, lower in the micro shunt group versus trabeculectomy. And the reason really is that the most common post-operative in intervention was laser suture lysis. And some people really consider that just part of the trabeculectomy procedure, but um, that does involve patients coming back to the office. And you know there is some risk associated with that procedure when you are trying to titrate that pressure pretty low. But I really draw your attention here when comparing the two groups, a higher rate of cataract progression in the trabeculectomy group, a higher rate of bleb leak, and a higher rate of some of the issues that come along with lower pressures. So shallowing of the anterior chamber of choroidal effusions. Again, these are not uh, uh, very large differences, but um, some of them were significant between the two groups. And really what we're gonna wanna do is look at this now out two years and see uh, what the differences look like. But you know, overall, both procedures really did perform very, very well with trabeculectomy uh, resulting in lower IOPs on fewer medications. So um, you know, I think this is a really nice study. Uh, I really commend uh, 
uh, all the uh, investigators with all their hard work that they put into this. But you'll see here at year one, the average pressure in the microshunt group was about 14.2 millimeters of mercury on 0.6. Uh, medications. And in the TRAB group, it was 11.2 on 0.3 medications. So honestly, I, I think we're all very happy with the microshunt uh, results here. Um, but you know, you have to keep learning how to do trabeculectomy for all the fellows and students out there. It still is a wonderful procedure. It probably still is our gold standard procedure, and it really does work. Um, again, the issue with trabeculectomy, I think a lot of times, is that re reproducibility uh, that some of us have some issues with, and again, some of the safety concerns. But, um, you know, I think this trial really uh, nicely illustrates uh, how both of these procedures uh, hopefully can benefit our patients moving forward. And so, again, once again, thanks to the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society and the American Glaucoma Society for allowing me to deliver this presentation. Um, it's wonderful uh, getting us all together again to, uh, you know, uh, promote educational conferences such as this. Thank you. Our final speaker is Dr. Ying Han. Dr. Han is a professor of ophthalmology and director of glaucoma at the University of California, San Francisco. And she'll be discussing tube shunt implantation in the new age of glaucoma surgery. Hello, everyone. Welcome to AGS, APGS seminar. My name is Ying Han. My presentation is Tube Shunt Surgery, the New Era of Glaucoma Surgery. So although the trabeculectomy is still the main incisional glaucoma surgery, the use of glaucoma drainage device is on the rise, especially for patients with a secondary surgery or patients with a high risk. From the TVT and the PTVT study, we learned that tube shunt surgery it it's safe with low risk of complications. For patients with prior incisional surgery, especially for patients with a high intraoperative pressure uh, at pre-op, tube shunt surgery may provide better outcome compared to trabeculectomy. However, there are still issues uh, with tube shunt surgery. For example, how to prevent cornea decomposition and how to prevent hypertensive phase or improve a long-term su success rate for the tube shunt surgery. For the next few minutes, I would like to share with you our studies uh, to solve those two, pro two problems. So first is how to preserve cornea. In order to preserve cornea after tube shunt surgery, we want to place the tube away from the cornea. Past planar tube placement has been proposed to protect the cornea endothelial cell. However, it requires a vitrectomy procedure, which is not an easy procedure for anterior segment surgeon. So we advocate tube placement in sulcus place. This is a works well for patients uh, with a pseudophagia status. As showed in uh, the picture on the right side, the two arrows pointing to the sulcus tube placed behind the iris and in front of intraocular lens uh, in this anterior segment OCT image. So here's a video to show how we place the sulcus tube. We trim the tube with a bevel down configuration, and then we inject a viscoelastic in the sulcus and also in anterior chamber. We use a 20 gauge MVR blade, enter the eye and into the sulcus from four millimeter away from the limbus. And after that, uh, we inject a viscoelastic into the same path to smooth the path, and then followed by the tube inserted into the sulcus uh, through the same path, which is uh, entered uh, behind the iris and also uh, in front of uh, uh, intraocular lens. So then we conduct a study to examine the effect of a tube position on cornea endothelial cell count, uh, AC tube versus a sulcus tube. So we have uh, two groups of patients. Uh, each group has about a hundred eyes and both groups are comparable in all, nearly all baseline uh, patient characteristics, except in follow-up a month. The sulcus tube has a shorter follow-up time compared to AC tube. To compensate for that, we calculate monthly uh, endothelial cell density to adjust for, justify for the different follow-up time. 
So monthly ECD endothelial cell density equals to follow-up ECD minus baseline ECD divided by follow-up period. So this is our outcome. And we find out uh, at, the fall, at the latest follow-up, the anterior chamber, uh, when the tube was placed in the anterior chamber, it has more endothelial cell loss compared to sulcus tube. We also did a multi-variable analysis and we find out after justify all the uh, uh, significant risk factors, anterior chamber tube placement is a significant risk factor for endothelial cell loss. So in summary, compared to anterior segment placement, sulcus, uh, uh, ciliary sulcus tube implantation may be a preferred surgery approach to reduce endothelial cell loss in pseudophagic patients. Currently, we're, we're prepared for a clinical trial to compare uh, AC tube versus a sulcus tube uh, and observe their endothelial cell loss over time. Second question we're study is how to prevent hypertensive phase and improve long-term intraocular pressure control. So we know the mito so we thought about mitomycin in this uh, uh, to solve this problem. And the mitomycin and the tube shunt are not a new topic. It has been used in tube shunt surgery. Three uh, uh, RCT clinical trial has been published to examine intraoperative use of mitomycin in tube shunt surgery and they find out it only help intraocular pressure reduction at one month, but not as long term. So it seems uh, the antifibrotic effect from a single intraoperative use of mitomycin may not be enough. We thought about the use of intraoperative and the postoperative mitomycin because tube shunt placement, the, the plate is as a foreign body, constant stu stimulated the tenons and it may causing the fibrosis and the scar tissue formation even after the surgery. Therefore, we think the postoperative post use of mitomycin is also crucial and important. We have two retrospective studies from our group and the suggest intraoperative and the postoperative use of mitomycin may uh, pr promote long-term uh, success rate and decrease the rate of hypertensive phase. So based on those retrospective study, uh, we conduct a, a prospective study. It's almond mitomycin comparative trial, AMC trial. The purpose of this uh, study is to investigate the effect of intra and postoperative mitomycin C on surgical outcomes of almond glaucoma valve implantation. So this is a multi-center prospective double maxed two arm RCT. One arm is a subconjunctiva mitomycin injection. The concentration is 0.4 milligram per ml for 0.1 during the surgery and afterwards. The second arm, it's a subconjunctiva injection, same amount of a balanced cell solution during the surgery and at the post-op follow-ups. Here's the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the injection of the mitomycin occurs during the surgery and at the one week and the one month. So the mitomycin we use is the common type almond FP7. If intraocular pressure greater than 10 at the follow-ups, aqueous suppression medications were started in either arm. We hold off the injection if the pressure is too low or there's a corridor or with a shallow chamber. So here's the result. Between both groups, mitomycin group and the uh, BSS group, we have about 50 patients in each group. And the basic baseline characteristics were comparable between both groups except the mitomycin group has a slightly younger age. And they use a similar number of medications. So here's the result at, of intraocular pressure uh, in this trial from baseline at the one, to the one, 12 months follow-up. So both between mitomycin group and the BSS group, intraocular pressure were comparable except at the one month, mitomycin group has significantly lower intraocular pressure compared to uh, a BSS group. In terms, of, in terms of a number of uh, topical glaucoma medications, mitomycin group has significantly decreased the number of uh, 
uh, topical glaucoma medications at month two, month three, month six, and month 12. In terms of visual acuity at month 12, mitomycin group has a 6% of patients with loss of a two lines of Schnellen visual acuity. BSS group has 20.5%. The p-value was not reached significant at this point. Complications be between those two groups were very comparable. Success rate at uh, 12 months was 85% for the mitomycin group and 67% for the BSS group p-value reached 0 0.04. And the definition of the success are listed as the following, the pressure less than 21 milligram mercury and 20% of IOP reduction, no need for additional glaucoma surgery, vision was not worse than no light perception, and there's uh, no removal of a, a glaucoma implant. So in conclusion, uh, this is the first RTC to examine use of mitomycin, both intra and postoperatively. Intraocular pressure was significantly uh, uh, lower at one month in mitomycin arm, which is corresponding to avoid the hypertensive phase. Number of topical medications were statistically significantly lower at months two, three, six, and 12 in mitomycin arm. And it's, it seems safe to use intraoperative and postoperative mitomycin with 12 months of follow up. So here's our current regimen. We're using intraoperative injection of mitomycin, 0.4 mg per ml for 0.1 ml. And we do it during intraoperatively and also postoperatively. Postoperatively, we, we do the injection at the one week and the one month. We hold off injection if the pressure is too low or has corridors or the chambers are shallow. And be cautious of a mitomycin application for patients with uveitic glaucoma. Uh, or patient has immune uh, insufficiency to avoid infection or uh, hypony. So here's a quick video to show uh, uh, intraoperative mitomycin injection. We inject the mitomycin over the plate by the end of the surgery. Uh, this video is to show uh, the uh, mitomycin injection during the post-op follow-up at the one week or one month. First, we apply topical uh, uh, anesthetic uh, uh, medications. And secondly, we use a 4% lidocaine soaked the Q-tip to apply to the plate uh, of where the tube was, uh, the tube shell, the plate is located for multiple times. And then uh, we inject the mitomycin mixed with 2% uh, uh, lidocaine uh, subconjunctiva into the subconjunctiva space um, uh, over the plate. And finally, we uh, rinse the uh, eyeball uh, copiously uh, with, uh, 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 with the BSS to prevent uh, uh, the, prevent the uh, ir uh, irritation. So finally, I would like to uh, uh, thank grant funding for all the studies and thank my mentors and then my collaborators uh, listed in this slides. Finally, I want to uh, uh, promote uh, 2020 AGS annual meeting uh, in March uh, 4th to uh, uh, 7th. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank all the speakers for their outstanding presentations. And we're going to begin the Q&A portion of the program. Um, I would encourage the audience to submit questions. We've already received a couple of them already. But the uh, icon for uh, submitting questions is in the lower right portion of your panel. If you don't see it, you might just refresh your screen. Um, the first question I'm going to that we received, I'm going to direct to Norman, and it says um, it asks in general, do you discourage laser refractive surgery in myopes with additional risk factors for glaucoma? Norman, can you unmute, unmute yourself? please. Yeah, thanks. All right. To make that decision is really walking a tightrope. All right. There are many things that you will have to consider, you know, thinking very well that there are advantages for a myope to undergo refractive surgery. However, personally, I tend to go more to the conservative side, rather than taking a big risk, particularly in eyes that have other 
risk factors, meaning if there is a family history of glaucoma and other things that I might find to increase their risk profile, then I would rather err on the more conservative decision and that is not to allow refractive surgery. Great, thanks. Thanks, Norman. Um, we have a couple of questions about tube shunt surgery and um, I'll direct those towards Ying. Uh, the first relates to um, sulcus tube placement in an aphagic patient, whether that can be done. And, um, and the second question is about sulcus tube placement and, and IOL position. Does, um, does the tube affect IOL position? Does there, is there any induced astigmatism that occurs? Ying, can you address those questions? Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Getty. Um, those are good questions, great questions. Uh, first one is, can you place a sulcus tube in a faking patient? Uh, the answer is yes, you can, um, but uh, you need to make sure uh, uh, the vitreous, there's no vitreous around the tube. Uh, because even for the aphic patients, uh, if you have if you haven't done thorough vitrectomy, this vitreous may plug on the tube. Uh, secondly, uh, the purpose of a put a tube into the sulcus is uh, to away from cornea. So uh, just remember to uh, place the tube away from cornea for aphic patient as well. Uh, for the second question is, uh, would the tube in the sulcus change the LL position? Uh, in my observation, we haven't had that issues. Uh, I think the reason is the tube is a silicone tube. It's very soft. Uh, and LL, uh, after you place in intraoperatively, it uh, stay pretty stable and has scar tissue formed uh, within the bag. So it's not easy to change the LL position with a soft tube. Uh, then would this cause astigmatism after tube shunt surgery? I think, I believe there's a, uh, Journal of Glaucoma uh, has a recent publication shows that there's not much astigmatism happened after tube shunt surgery, uh, but uh, this is a good, great question. More study is needed. Thank you. Thanks, Yang. A couple of questions about the micropulse that will direct to Paul. Um, one is um, about uh, the treating the horizontal meridian. A second um, uh, relates to use of micro pulse technique increases the amount of energy totally absorbed by the pars plane and, and thus damages the tissue. What then would be its advantages over traditional uh, diode? And the last, um, uh, Paul, was do you always use viscoelastic to ensure the hydration of the conjunctiva when performing micropulse therapy? Or can you use only BSS? Thank you, Dr. Getty. Uh, in the first so to answer the first question, the reason why we avoid the horizontal uh, meridian is that there's the uh, long posterior to the nerves and arteries there. I guess we are worried about pain. And of course, we don't really feel that there's a need to, to have any uh, inflammation or, or radiation on those two uh, important structures. All that said and done, <clears throat> uh, I, I know some surgeons do cross the horizontal meridian and treat, and there's not, there doesn't seem to be much um, damage or any real you know, late, late, uh, complications. I, I would suggest that if you can avoid those areas just for the safety of those anatomical structures. Um, now, the next question was one where if we are already treating the um, with increased micropulse plus, why do we, what's, what's the difference on this end? When you say traditional diode, I, I suppose you mean Vipro. Well, well, the first thing is that, you know, please bear in mind we're treating the past planar, we're not treating the past placata. Um, the objective here is that micropulse tree on the past planar may lower pressure by uveal spiral outflow effects, but certainly avoiding any thermal effects to the ciliary body where aqueous is produced. So I think that's kind of important. We don't want to decrease aqueous production. That's the big uh, aspect of micropulse uh, to past planar PLT that we're trying to push here that we don't want to damage the ciliary body. All that said and done, when we when we brought out the micropulse plus technique, it was for failed micropulse three patients where there was ongoing inflammation in the eye, and these refractory glaucoma patients didn't have much pressure lowering with micropulse three, or the, the pressure lowering was not sustained. Then we did micropulse plus to the past planar to get rid of some of the inflammatory fibrosis on the past planar that may be waterproofing it and preventing lower spiral outflow. So. Uh, 
the objective here was just to augment the microsoft field of the task plane if, if if you think that your patient needs aqueous uh your celery body ablation and the, the reduction of aqueous reduction then that's when you do a g pro uh, so it's, it's a different indication from traditional laser and uh as for the last question uh the question is about uh using some viscoelastic uh, on the comp surface. Yeah, I think you've got to keep the comp surface wet. I, I use um, you know, this um, BSS for the, for the Generation 1 Pro, uh, and I think it probably will work for Gen 2 Pro as well, but um, if you have a slightly thicker um, media, like a, like a bit of a, um, viscoelastic, yes, that, that may, be, may be also fine. And uh, you need to have something on the surface, not just, uh, you know, not, not just dry, please. Great, thank you, Paul. I have a question that I'm gonna to direct to Dr. Park. Um, so Dr. Park, in the future, do you think fundus photography or OCT images will be more promising in its application in deep learning for detection of glaucoma and glaucomatous progression? Thank you for your question. Um, in clinical practice, uh, well, now we are using, already we are using AI in uh, OCT um, because OCT can um, compare normative database and um, OCT can help um, to provide um, progression analysis. So um, AI is already in uh, OCT. Um, but uh, regarding uh, fundus photography, um, it has the limitation that um, it is less objective and uh, less a quantitative method. Um, but nowadays, deep learning um, can help to interpret their fundus photograph. So in future, in near future, um, we, can, we can understand how the machine sees the photograph. And and with the adversarial explanations, we can understand how the machine can interpret fundus uh, photograph. So in near future, um, I think both fundus photograph and OCT can be used um, using deep learning method and to assist our clinical decision to detect glaucoma and to determine glaucoma progression. Both will be very important. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna direct a question to Ahmad Araf. Ahmad, um, what is the best OCT parameter for differentiation of glaucoma suspects from actually uh, true glaucoma? Um, you know, I think we're fortunate in that uh, each of the parameter categories, optic nerve, peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer and macula, each have uh, high diagnostic capability. And it's been shown that they're complementary to one another. And when used together, you can increase the diagnostic capability even further. Um, the problem is sometimes the results are inconsistent with each other. And in those instances, of course, we have to rely on our clinical judgment. Um, for example, if a patient has macular disease, such an epiretinal membrane or uh, macular edema or anything like that, you're obviously gonna place more weight on optic nerve head parameters and, and vice versa. Um, there are newer metrics that rely on very advanced um, statistical techniques that combine the different metrics from each of these parameters. And I think the diagnostic yield using these new metrics will be much better than what we currently have. And hopefully those will be available soon. Great, thank you. Ying, there's a couple of additional questions relating to um, complications associated with intraoperative and postoperative uh, mitomycin C use with tube shunt surgery. Uh, thank you, Dr. Getty. Uh, these are very good questions, and this is definitely a good concern uh, because our trial is only one year, um, so we can't we don't know the long term um, complications from this. Uh, uh, prospective trial, but we do have a retrospective a study published once in 2008, once recent, two or three years ago. So we observed the patient seven years or five years to seven years after tube shunt surgery. And then the complication rate in that paper, AGO paper was comparable from a published complication from tube shunt surgery. So, 
so so it's a great question we need to uh, pay attention to uh, but based on our experience at UCSF for past 15 years uh, we'll feel comfortable uh, with the mitomycin use intraoperative and the postoperative. Thanks Ying. Joe uh, Panarelli, Joe you, you uh, provided some results of the landmark uh, multi-center randomized clinical trial comparing trabeculectomy and Fraser flow. Um, are there any particular patients that you believe would benefit from one of these two procedures over the other? I think that's that's a great question, Dr. Getty. And you know, looking at the results, both groups did rather well at one year. But you know, if you really stratify the patients based upon their uh, baseline or preoperative IOP, you know, I think it's uh, it becomes a little more clear that patients who had a lower starting IOP likely did better with trabeculectomy. And that's because that remains the only titratable procedure. So I think for your patients who have a lower IOP to begin with, who you need to get down even further, trabeculectomy probably remains your best option. For patients who had a, a higher starting IOP, so a pressure over 21 millimeters of mercury, I think both procedures performed well. And in those situations, it really depends upon the, the risk profile you're willing to undertake. I think one of the benefits of the preser flow is that hopefully we see it's a, a bit of a safer procedure and it's a little more predictable and reproducible uh, depending upon uh, how you compare that to your comfort level with trabeculectomy. But I, I think looking at the baseline or preoperative IOP is key when deciding on procedures. Great, thanks. Paul, another question about uh, micropulse and about uh, safety in children. Any experience with uh, micropulse in children? Uh in terms of safety, uh, I don't think we've noticed any um, serious, many, they're not serious adverse events. I think it's safe enough to use for, for children. I, of course, children is a very broad term. I mean, um, infants versus maybe, you know, 10 year olds is a, it's a different group. Um, but in general, we do use it because the disease is severe and because often the, 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 the disease is progressive or ongoing, it probably doesn't really have long-term uh, pressure lowering success for this group. It probably lowers pressure well for three months, six months, uh, beyond which probably you will see a pressure rise again. So while it's safe, I would say it's at best, it's temporizing uh, rather than permanent for treatment. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, Norman, there looks like there's another question for you. Um, it's, it asks, what is, RNFL texture, and are there any means of assessing RNFL texture? One of the challenges is to really look for anatomic evidence of progression. And I think there is a group in Hong Kong that is using OCT technology to look at the RNFL and you know how it changes through time, how it changes as the disease progresses. So as I was saying earlier, we need to look for novel ways of looking at progression or looking for progression in our myopic patients. And that is one of the things that have come out uh, looking at the RNFL rather than our standard parameters of anatomic changes uh, heralding progression. Great, thank you. Ying, um, there was a question clarifying the protocol for post-operative mitomycin C injections in your AMC trial. Was it done on all patients at a week and a month, or were there some specific criteria for those post-operative mitomycin C injections? Thank you, Dr. Getty. Uh, it's a standard protocol uh, for all the patients, uh, injection at the one week and the one month unless patient has a pressure less than five or has corridors with a shallow chamber. Otherwise, it's a standard protocol. Thank you. Great. Uh, Dr. Paterelli, a question about whether microshunt can be combined with phaco emulsification, and if so, where would the insertion site be located? And another good question. Um, you know, in this study, uh, it was performed as a standalone procedure, but yeah, there's no reason you cannot perform it with phaco emulsification. The question will be what effect the phaco emulsification might have on wound healing and what kind of uh, IOP results we might see uh, if we do it as a combined procedure. I think that's, that's unknown. In terms of where to put it, uh, I think you would uh, probably most likely place the device in the anterior chamber. 
though we have uh, many of us who have used the device have postulated whether or not we can place it into the sulcus safely. It is a rather long device at eight and a half millimeters in length with a 70 micron lumen. So uh, you might be able to place it in the sulcus, but I think uh, initially most of us will be placing it just deep in the anterior chamber. Great. The next question I'm going to actually direct to both uh, Ahmad and Norman, and it relates to what level of myopia may render inaccuracies in OCT RNFL thickness measurements for both cirrus and spectralis. Maybe um, uh, Ahmad, can, maybe we'll have you comment first. Great uh, imaging lecture and Norman, a great uh, myopia lecture. So I'll tap into both of your expertise. Um, well, I think, you know, assuming we're talking about axial myopia, um, because of course, um, you know, myopic refractive error would be a surrogate for axial myopia. And it, it turns out that in the normative database for the serious and the conventional spectralis didn't include um, many myopic subjects. And so uh, it, in terms of a level of myopia, it doesn't take all that much, I think, to for those subjects to differ from your patient and um, to give you a false positive result. I will say that the um, most updated spectralis software, the glaucoma module premium edition, the normative database with that software um, does have a range of myopic subjects uh, up to six diopters of myopia. And so probably with, with using that software, you can tolerate higher levels of myopia and be a little bit more confident that you're blunting your false positivity. Great. Norman, I agree, have, I agree because you know the current databases that we have in all the machines really do not take uh, into consideration a lot of myopic subjects, particularly those with moderate to high myopia. And that is why one of the things that we would like to see in the future is more data, including our myopic patients and our myopic eyes, for us to really be guided a little better than what we currently have. Yes. Thanks, Norman. Uh, Yang, another question for you about um, whether uh, 5 fluorouracil might be considered as an alternative to myomycin C, especially for the post-operative injections. Um, Thank you, Dr. Gaddy. Uh, it's a good question, it's a great question. Uh, we start actually with a, a 5-FU uh, 15 years ago for post-operative anti-metabolic -met injection, uh, but we do 5-FU weekly five times. That was the protocol at that time. Uh, however, personally, I works better than metomycin. Uh, it's also require more frequent injections. So I would recommend using mitomycin instead of 5-IFU uh, after the, during, during the surgery and the post -operally. Thank you. Great, thanks. Paul, another question for you about um, whether topical anesthesia would be possible um, for uh, micropulse or does it require uh, retrobulbar or peribulbar injection? Uh, originally, thanks. Originally, we, we were using peribulbar for everyone, but over time and familiarity, we found that the many patients who are quite stoic and uh, calm and were able to accept topical anesthesia. So we do use uh, topical anesthesia now in the clinic on, on the proportion of our patients. If the eye is not inflamed and the conch is not too red and the patient's not a squeezer, then usually we just give them about, about uh, 30 minutes or 40 minutes of, uh, of a pre-op. Uh, topical anesthesia, um, either with a bleb or with a viscous drop, and then we proceed on with a conventional micropulse tree. So yeah, I, I think topical is suitable for some patients, but you've got to treat your patients well, and it can be quite gratifying, as well as, of course, um, very efficient for the clinic to do that. Great, thanks. Again, uh, another question regarding the myopic patient. In this case, I guess um, it's more related to tilted discs in glaucoma. Are there any adjustments made in OCT imaging to help monitor RNFL thickness accurately in the setting of the tilted optic nerves? Again, I'm gonna call upon the dynamic duo, uh, Ahmad and Norman here to address that question. Uh, 
And Norman, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Tilted, tilted discs, um, any special considerations here for monitoring? We, we know that tilting or you know, uh, alignment of the disc happens in myopia more as the myopia increases, but as far as imaging that tilted disc, I don't, or I am not aware of any current uh, developments regarding uh, compensations for that. Maybe Ahmad would uh, help us on that. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree, Norman. I don't know of a correction formula for retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Of course, Kiho, uh, you're an expert with regards to this. I know you've done a lot of work to show that, um, you know, rather than rely on retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in those cases, it may be better to rely more on uh, rim uh, area or on asymmetry of the GCIPL uh, in terms of macular thickness. And, and that's what I tend to do in practice. Yeah. Um, you are you are very correct because of tilted disc peripapillary RNFL thickness measurement may be um, artificially um, um, distorted. The thinning in the superior and inferior peak will be um, distorted. So um, we may we may use um, macular parameter parameters and also we may use um, BMOMLW or minimal rim width. Uh, instead of using uh, peripapillary thickness. Well, thanks for that comment. Well, I think we're approaching the time for conclusion of the webinar. So I'm gonna uh, pass the program uh, back over to Dr. Fong to um, uh, conclude it. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to all the speakers, uh, especially for the American Glaucoma Society speakers, because I know is uh, late uh, at night for you all in the US. And uh, I would like to just share the last uh, slide, which is on uh, our next uh, webinar, which is uh, in, con uh, in collaboration with the uh, uh, ISGS, the International Society of Glaucoma Surgery. And this will be held on the 6th of February, 2021. And I would like to mention that uh, this webinar uh, has been arranged mainly by uh, Professor Tanush uh, Dada, and I would like to thank him for his uh, efforts in arranging all these uh, webinars for the APGS. And uh, uh, again, I would like to thank all the speakers, and uh, especially for their uh, great lectures and also the, the Q&A. And we hope to see more uh, participants in the next webinar. And uh, I think today's webinar, we have a record of uh, over 1,000 uh, registrants. Uh, thank, thank everyone. Can we have the last slide? Yeah, thank everyone for uh, participation and uh, hope to see you all at the next webinar. And thank you. <laughs>